So today let's explore this failed power supply module donated by a viewer. Big thanks for the donation and let's explore it, let's see what's inside of it and how does it work. And let's figure out what failed in it and if it's fixable. It's a pulse dimension QS40 power supply. The input is a single phase universal mains voltage, 100 to 240 volts AC. And the output is DC 24 volts. And the continuous output power is 960 watts and the short term 1440 watts. So it's quite a powerful power supply and the voltage can be adjusted from 24 to 28 volts. It has indication LEDs here, some connections, DC OK shutdown and a switch for parallel or single use. Now it's in the single use position. Here's some more data on it. Can be adjusted in this range and at 24 volts up to 40 amps continuous and 60 amps short term. It goes on rail. And you can see the cooling grill is here and here. And he said it failed with a loud bang, so I'm not trying to power it now. We will just open it and see what's inside of it. There's some screw here, and most of the other screws are some security screws or torques. Then, do they actually think they're going to stop me from opening it? Let's just remove the screws and see. This comes off like this. It's actually one piece. Wrapped around it. And that's it. So the main comes in here. There is a metal oxide varistor for over voltage protection, some Y capacitors, X capacitors, interference filter inductors, the fuse in it, some transistor here, kind of oddly in the input section here, some small low value resistor here, and a big inductor here. It's probably the power factor correction. Big electrolytic capacitors here. And another interference filter is this or some transformer. I guess the main transformer is here. Another transformer. We have to explore further. Some relays. Some output inductor maybe. Small electrolytic capacitors. A lot of transistors or maybe power diodes on the heat sink here. You can also see some control chips here. Even more power semiconductors on a heat sink. I'm looking for something obvious that would explain a failure with a loud bang. The fuse is not open. Is the main input shorted? Not shorted. Life to neutral on this interference separation double coil. Not shorted. What about this transistor? Source to drain. You can see it's body diode. The MOSFET is not shorted. Some low resistance resistor here. It's not blown open circuit. The metal oxide varistor is probably in parallel to something I already checked, but let's check it once more. 300 kilo ohms. High resistance. Nothing on views yet. No blown capacitors, fuses. Nothing exploded. This looks nice. Well, now I actually see it. There's a big burnt area on the board. What the hell is this? It seems to be between these two screw terminals. Is this the life and the neutral going from the interference filter further? It's a little bit burnt here, but much more on this side. So this is probably a loud bang. It really looks like it arced between these two terminals. The measuring between them actually shows multiple hundred kilo ohms. It's a high impedance, high resistance. It's not shorted. But the meter is using a low voltage less than one volt. It might have arced over at a higher voltage from a minus. Was this arcing started by a failing component or was it just the board carbon tracking? I don't see any component here. And here it's not very visible. I have to disassemble it to see it better. The epicenter seems to be between the terminals. How is this even supposed to be taken apart? It looks like this is a separate part of the metal case, which actually comes off here. There is some screw here. And these. And then, nice! It easily separates after removing four screws. This seems to be the power supply section. And this seems to be the interference filter, the input section and the power factor correction section. The interference filter section should also separate. Let's unscrew the screws between which it arced. Then this connector should separate and maybe some screw here and the interference filter should come off. And that's it. That's the filter. Now you can see it a little bit better, but let's also try to separate this metal from it. 
three screws here, two screws here, basically screwing this metal to the heat sinks, and that's it. So now let's clean this, reassemble it and hopefully it works. I'm just kidding, that would be quite a crappy video, wouldn't it? Let's also test some components in it and let's try to partially reverse engineer it, at least the most important parts of it. Let's check some power components. The power components like power transistors and diodes are the most likely components to fail in a power supply, besides electrolytic capacitors of course. There are four power transistors on this heatsink, so let's test these. I'm testing them source to drain, which is basically in reverse for the end channel MOSFETs. And if I see the internal and parallel diode voltage drop, it verifies the transistor is neither blown open circuit nor shorted. Of course, more often transistors fail short circuit, especially the power ones. And all four transistors seem good. Good high voltage and channel MOSFETs. We can also test the gate to source. And it's probably some circuitry driving the gate, not the gate itself. And you can see some voltage drop of some gate driving circuit, there's some transistor. The important thing is it's not short circuit, it's not something under 0.1 volts. We can test some small SMD bipolar transistors here, the gate driving ones, base 2 emitter, base 2 collector and PN. The other one is probably PNP, emitter to base, collector to base, good. You can also test collector to emitter here, no short. An emitter to collector here, and that's something external, not a short. And the other identical pair of SMD transistors behaves exactly the same, so these should be good. These are basically gates driving current amplifiers. One pulls the gate up, one down, and it seems these two power transistors are in parallel and these two are in parallel, working as basically just two big transistors. These are in the power factor correction, switching this big inductor. And some more transistors and diodes. Here's the bridge rectifier. Some diodes, a transistor and a diode here. There's one power diode, ultra fast one probably. Another power diode, the third one here. All good, about half a volt voltage drop. There's some power transistor. This actually shows a short circuit one direction, but not the other one. I guess this is some gates driving circuit, you know, so the transistor shorted. And some capacitors charging there actually. Sometimes it might take multiple seconds for some capacitor in the circuit to charge, and before this happens the multimeter indicates a short circuit. If I flip it now, again it will indicate a short circuit for multiple seconds maybe, and then you can see the capacitor charging. And let's flip it again, beep. For quite some time actually, and then the capacitor charged and you can see the internal and parallel diode of this high voltage MOSFET and a channel 1, which goes source to drain. Of course the typical pinout of the transistor in a TO220 package is the gate on the left, the drain in the middle and the source on the right side. And the drain in the middle pin is also connected to the metal tab on it. And that's why it has to have a ceramic or mica or silicone isolation pad. In this case it looks ceramic. I can of course also test the bridge rectifier. One AC terminal to the positive, good. The other AC to the positive, good. And from the negative to one AC and to the other one, good. Whatever said the output, let's check if it's not shorted. The positive and the negative. And of course I can see some electrolytic capacitor charging and then open a circuit. That's good, no short. Some big SMD diode, this really begs to be tested, good. Of course you should check the electrolytic capacitors are discharged before you even start working on it. Discharged, 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 trying the four biggest ones here. But very often there is some discharging resistor or the circuitry discharges them. You can basically just check if there is a voltage on them or not. Fraction of a volt here, the same here, virtually nothing here, virtually nothing here. You can also use a diode test to check them for short. Charging good, charging good, charging. Good. This one is already charged because it's in parallel to this one. When the meter charges this one, it also charges this one. And this is a handy multimeter, the diode test in it goes up to about 3.2 volts, not just 2 volts like in other multimeters. The electrolytic capacitors are not shorted, but more often they fail open a circuit or a low capacitance high ESR. You can test them for this using an ESR meter or some internal resistance tester. This capacitor, just 58 milliohms, good. 
This one should be the same, it's in parallel. Then there are the other two smaller ones, which are in a series. 200 milliohms, good. 200 milliohms, still good. These are high voltage capacitors with not that much capacitance. This is still acceptable for 100 micro 350 volt capacitors. And this one is using 1 kilohertz, this one 100 kilohertz. So it's normal for it to read a bit lower here as well. The higher the capacitance, the lower the ESR should be for it to be still good. And of course I have to mention this ESR meter is supposed for electrolytic capacitors and it can't be used with batteries. Whereas this one is primarily meant for batteries, but it can also test electrolytic capacitors. Let's connect this to some older lithium-ion battery and it measures the voltage and the ESR or internal resistance of it. Now the power supply section. There seems to be a half bridge of MOSFETs on the primary side of it. One source to drain and the other source to drain, not shorted. Gates to source, no short, no short. Some gate driving circuitry. And the source of this one goes to the drain of this one, which demonstrates it's a half bridge. But I have to mention, if it was a two-switch forward, they would be connected via the primary of the transformer. And this multimeter using a DC current for the test would indicate it as a connection, basically, because the primary has a very low resistance for DC. So to verify, let's use this internal resistance meter, which is using AC current for the test, and shows one milliohm extremely low resistance, and this proves there is a straight connection, it's not via a winding. It can be a winding because it wouldn't be such a low resistance for AC current. Now let's try to figure out how this works. So the input voltage, about 400 volts or so, goes into this half bridge. This is switched into the transformer primary. There is also some resonant capacitor or a capacitive divider making the center point for the half bridge. And these capacitors could be also resonant if it's a resonant power supply, which it could be because there is no output inductor. There is an inductor on the primary side, which probably is in series with the primary. This inductor is actually connected and you can see it has just two pins. It's not a transformer, it's an inductor. And this inductor actually goes from the center point of the two transistors. Then via the inductor it goes to the primary and then these capacitors and the secondary is center tapped and there is a synchronous rectifier. On the secondary side for low voltage MOSFETs in a parallel pairs, this is the synchronous rectifier for the high current. Then it goes to the output capacitors, 35 volt ones, it makes sense for a 24 volt output. Then it goes via a tiny inductor here and here for more ripple suppression and to a smaller pair of output capacitors, which are again 35 volts. And the incoming voltage for this, about 400 maybe more volts, DC comes from this, the power factor correction, which rectifies the mains and also uses a boost topology. So the current drawn from a mains is a sine wave. Instead of drawing a current just as the peak of each half cycle, it's a boost PFC, so it can draw actually current during the entire cycle, even when the instantaneous voltage is lower than the voltage on these capacitors. 400 volt capacitors, 330 micro. So I guess on these capacitors the voltage has to be just below 400 volts. It has to be higher than the peak voltage of mains, but lower than this rating. And there seems to be a double boost. It's boosting the voltage before the smoothing, after the bridge rectifier. And then for pre-regulation it's actually boosting it again using this transistor, this diode, and this inductor with an auxiliary winding on it. This inductor is the main power factor correction with these transistors and these diodes. This is the second boost with this inductor, the pre-regulation, which actually goes into these capacitors. The voltage already is probably higher than 400 volts, that's why there are two capacitors in a series. And this power factor correction circuitry actually baffled me for some time. I was probing it and trying to figure out what goes where. And this is not easy to reverse engineer, the board is about four layers. So there are two hidden layers which you can't see. And the sources of all four transistors here are commoned and they appear to go nowhere. And the drains are commoned in these two and in these two. I was thinking about it and it was making absolutely no bloody sense until it finally striked me. But to explain it I should reverse engineer the simplified schematic of it. Basically a schematic of the power path, just the power components. And here's the simplified schematic of it. For simplicity I'm not drawing the input section with the fuse metal oxide varistor interference filter and so on. I'm just drawing the active power factor correction which is the first boost and the second boost circuitry which is basically a pre-regulator and then the half bridge with the isolated power supply. And of course the most interesting thing about it is the power factor correction, which unlike in a typical active power factor correction circuit, has the boost inductor and the switching transistors on the AC side, on the input side of the bridge rectifier. 
and because it's AC here, it has to use two MOSFETs in anti-series basically as a bidirectional switch. Each of these is actually two in parallel, so it's in total four. And it's using two ultra-fast diodes, one for each half cycle. And then after the power factor correction it goes into these capacitors, and then we add the second boost into these ones. Then there's the half bridge and the resonant inductor, the primary of the main transformer, this capacitive divider which is also the resonant capacitors, and the center tap secondary is basically synchronously rectified, again two and two transistors in parallel actually, and these capacitors, some inductors and more capacitors at the output. Now this is definitely the most interesting part of it, and the explanation for this crazy contraption is probably nothing else than efficiency chasing insanity. Now let's try to explain it. In a positive half cycle, when this one is positive and this one is negative, the current can go through this inductor, these transistors, and here, when they're on, and when they're off, the current actually goes via this diode into these capacitors and this way, which is basically similar to this. And these are switching at a high frequency, so during one half cycle it actually alternates between these two paths multiple times. And in the other half cycle, when this thing is positive and this thing negative, the current goes from here, through this diode in the bridge rectifier, through the capacitors again, and then via this diode, when these transistors are off, and when they are on, it actually goes through the transistors, through this inductor, and basically accumulates energy in it, which then can be used to boost the voltage and charge these capacitors to a higher voltage than the peak level of the sine wave. Which means it's only using this diode in the bridge rectifier and this one. It seems it's not using this one or this one. Where it basically only uses these two orange diodes as inrush bypass diodes when it's initially powered. I hope my explanation makes sense. The negative and positive half cycle operation is basically very similar, other than the current is the other way. And it's either using this diode or this diode in the bridge rectifier and this or this ultra fast diode. And of course the diodes in this bridge rectifier are not ultra fast, they are slow diodes, but it doesn't matter, they don't have to switch a high frequency. They even have some capacitors in parallel to them, actually, which I didn't draw, so there is just minus frequency AC on them, not a high frequency. The orange diodes in the bridge rectifier basically do the same job as this diode in a typical power factor correction. And if you're asking how this thing is more efficient than this one, that's because it eliminates some diode voltage drops. To accumulate energy in the inductor of a typical power factor correction, the current has to go through two diodes in the bridge rectifier, and when using the energy from the inductor to produce an additional voltage to boost the mains voltage, it's actually one diode here, one diode here and one here, so it's three diodes when pumping energy into this capacitor. So it alternates between two and three voltage drops. Here it actually pumps energy into the inductor with no diode voltage drop, and when it goes into the capacitors, it's two diode voltage drops, one here and one in the bridge rectifier. So basically two diode voltage drops are eliminated when the energy flows into the inductor and one diode voltage drop is eliminated when the current goes into the capacitors. So this thing looks odd, but logically it should improve the efficiency. That's definitely quite an interesting but also overcomplicated power supply. And of course the video is getting bloody long and also taking bloody long to finish. I had to multitask between way too many things. But in the next episode I will try to fix it and, if it works, do some measurements in it. So that's it, and if you like my videos, please consider subscribing, supporting my channel on Patreon or using the thanks button, because this is what keeps my crazy channel running, and a big thanks to all of you who already support me.